that we keep on talking about, not only in free grace theology, but on these on these videos, is the judgment seat of Christ. Right. And the judgment seat of Christ is one of how many major judgments are there? Like three, three major judgments, four maybe? Well, most people think there's one, the great white throne judgment, right. and they think all these other things, the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment of the sheep and the goats, etc., are right. all just variations of that. There's different names for it. But yeah, there's at least the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment of the sheep and the goats, yeah. and the great white throne judgment. And, and I would add a number four. When you come to faith in Christ for that first time, you pass out of, you'll never come under judgment ever again. Right. So it's almost like your eternal destiny is already decided there. Right. Some people consider that a fourth judgment. John 5, 24, you shall not come into judgment concerning eternal destiny. So you've already been declared righteous right. and it's a done deal. But if you, if you rightly divide the word, if you make the bib biblical distinctions that are there, you'll see that there are at least three judgments, possibly four. Right. And one of those judgments is called the judgment seat of Christ. And you can read about it, especially in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. But that is for evaluating believers in order to determine their level of reward. Right. And the exact expression, the judgment seat of Christ, is found in the majority of manuscripts in Romans 14, 10 to 12, and in the critical and the majority text in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. Right. And then there are lots and lots of other passages that refer to the day or the day of Christ or the day of the Lord Jesus or uh, His day or the day of judgment that refer to the judgment seat of Christ also. Right. And here, uh, we're going to look at 2 Timothy 2, 12. It's uh, alluding to the judgment seat of Christ without right. using the exact language. Right. So eternal life is a free gift, but eternal rewards are given on the basis of works. They take effort. Right. And one of the very best rewards that you can get is to rule with Christ. Right. Right. That's that's why God created man, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. He created us to rule over creation. Have dominion, be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and then you're to have dominion over the earth and all the animals on the earth. Right. And all throughout the Bible, you have examples of faithful believers uh, rising to positions of rulership. Joseph over Egypt, Daniel over Babylon, Esther over, what is it, Persia, yeah. uh, Moses over Israel, Abraham over the nations. You know, there's all kinds of examples of rulership. Right. But the ultimate rulership, of course, is Jesus over the kingdom forever and ever, and us ruling under Christ. Right. He told the, the 12 apostles, or the 11 plus Matthias, who took Judas's place, that they would sit on 12 thrones and rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. There's rulership too. Right. But for most believers, rulership is not a guarantee. You, you may fail to rule with Christ. Right. That's only given to some believers. And the parable of the Minas in Luke 19 is right. an example of that. How some people get to rule over 10 cities, some over 5, and some not at all. Correct. But you still get to be in the kingdom. Right. All right. I think that sets up uh, this passage in 2 Timothy. Right. Uh, because people quote this to me all the time, and they think what it means is um, you will go to... It's possible for a believer, if you mess up and you don't really live out the Christian life, for you to go to hell. But that's not at all even what, what Paul says on the surface no. of things. So here's what Paul says to Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11, 12, and 13. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Reign with him. So this is not about going to heaven or to hell. This is about ruling with Christ. Correct. If we endure, we shall reign with him. Is it is it enough to just believe to reign with him? No, we have to endure to reign. But if we deny him, check this out, if we deny him, he will also deny us. Deny us what? Well, it, that's the big issue, but I would say in the context, and I think in Matthew 10, 32, and 33, which is what Paul is commenting on here, he will deny us the privilege of reigning with him. I mean, that's what the text says, doesn't it say? If we endure, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, that is, if we don't endure in the faith, if at some point right. we deny Christ, right. then guess what? He's going to deny us the reward of ruling with him. Right. Isn't that what he says right Absolutely. on the surface? If we are faithless, 
he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, it means what it sounds like. Even if we are faithless in our Christian experience, he remains faithful to his promise that whoever believes in him will not perish but has everlasting life. So we're guaranteed that we are eternally secure even if we're faithless. In fact, some commentators have said, and I think rightly so, that verses 11 to third and 13, 11 and 13 are twin pillars of eternal security. Hmm. When we believe, we die with Christ, therefore we'll live with him forever. Right. And even if we're faithless, he remains faithful, that is faithful to his promise of life, for he cannot deny himself. Right. Now he can deny us the privilege of ruling, but he can't deny himself, which would be what would happen is if he took away everlasting life. So you'll live with him forever. If you're a believer, you'll live with him forever. But it's possible that Jesus will say, uh, you don't get to rule with me forever. Right. In Matthew 10, 32 and 33, that's where Jesus said, he who confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Well, the second half of that, verse 33, is he who denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father who is in heaven. Mm. Well, that's what Paul is commenting on here in the second half of verse 12. And commentators point out that he's explaining it, he's interpreting it by saying, if we endure, we'll reign. If we don't, if we deny him, we, he will deny us the privilege of ruling. So how important would you say is the idea of the judgment seat of Christ and of eternal rewards, and of a literal kingdom in the future to Bible interpretation. It's absolutely essential, because here's the alternative, Sean. If we don't believe in the judgment seat of Christ as a distinct judgment, then what we think is, and this is sadly what most people in evangelicalism think, that I don't know where I'm going when I die. And I hope that when I go to the great white throne judgment, I hope my deeds are good enough to, to where I either kept my salvation or prove I had it. But either way, I'm hoping I come out well at the great white throne judgment, but I won't know until then. And so I go through life with what I call daisy theology. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. I hope right. my end my life on he loves me. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm trying hard to persevere so I can make it into his kingdom. That's the wrong way to live. God wants us to be sure we're his children, to be sure we have everlasting life, and then to live in a way that pleases him. And knowing for sure we have a secure relationship mm. with him is vital to living a God-pleasing life. Well, that's a great thought, Bob, and I hope it inspires everyone to keep on enduring so that one day Jesus will reward you with ruling with him. Amen.